coming up on this episode of Harmless. As a prosecutor, your job is to do justice. So I understand that making the decision to not charge someone sometimes should be celebrated versus charging someone and getting a million years sentence. We're going to prepare you emotionally and mentally for these cases. We're going to give you upfront tools so that hopefully you can recognize in yourself when you're having a trauma response. I had kids on the witness stand talking about it. I met with victims countless times and talked to them about it. That does not prepare you to handle sexual exploitation of a minor because it's one thing to read about it, to talk about it, to ask questions about it, to argue about it, and then see it completely different. Welcome to Harmless the Podcast. My name is Eric Oldenburg, your host. And today you're going to be listening to a very good friend of mine, longtime friend of mine, the Honorable Brad Ostrowski. As of the airing of this episode, Brad has been a sitting Arizona State Superior Court judge for 12 years. I met Brad way back in 2001 when I first started investigating internet crimes against children. He was the prosecutor that I submitted my cases to. Well, now fast forward all this time, Brad has not only seen the landscape change from prosecuting these types of crimes in a non-digital era, but he's also gotten a perspective from not just being a prosecutor, but also being a judge, which is fascinating to me. This interview is extremely candid, and I cannot thank Brad enough for doing this for me and for you. His introspection, empathetic standpoint, and compassion for all of those affected by this work is exemplary. A quick note about the audio quality in this episode. Brad and I were sitting on the back patio of my small hobby farm, and you may hear some farm animals in the background, some roosters and things like that. Apologies for that. Thank you for understanding. So without further ado, I give you my good friend, the Honorable Brad Ostrowski. I moved to Arizona in 1992 to attend the University of Arizona Law School. I graduated law school in 1995. My goal was to become a prosecutor. Before I went to law school, I didn't know any lawyers, never met a lawyer. All I knew was what I saw on TV. Why did you want to become a prosecutor? What sparked it for you to, hey, that's what I want to do? Because of an internal sense of justice and prosecutors were the good guys. I think growing up having no control over myself and my environment and things I thought were wrong. I think standing up for people that were victims and standing up against those who were committing wrong was something that was bred into me, if you will, of my environment. So I wanted to be a prosecutor. That's what I attended law school to, be, to become. And that's in Tucson. What brought you up to Phoenix? Well, Tucson's a great place to go to school. But in terms of opportunities for jobs, there was going to be more in Phoenix. You moved to Phoenix when? Graduated May of 95, took the bar exam down in Tucson, and then moved up to Phoenix after I took the bar exam and looked for a job. Prosecutor officers typically won't hire you until you pass the bar. You take the bar exam in July, you find out you pass in October, and then you apply to be a prosecutor. And that's what I did. At that time in 95, there had been about a year's long hiring freeze the county because the county was not in good shape financially. And then shortly after I passed the bar, they started lifting that hiring freeze and they started hiring a bunch of prosecutors and I was in that group. What was the first thing you started prosecuting? You start off in training, then you go from training to the preliminary hearing bureau. So you handle all cases where you're getting probable cause determination in front of a judge. And then you go to a general trial group where you handle all manner of cases from drug cases to violent crimes. Do you remember some of the first cases that you worked or cases you prosecuted? Sure. I remember my first, or well, one of my first trials, I should say, it was a road rage case where a guy didn't like this way this woman was driving and he pulled a gun on her in the street and uh, went to trial and he was convicted. The weird part about that case is that he was guilty. He pointed a gun on her. That was the issue. The issue is, once you're convicted of an aggravated assault class three dangerous felony in the state of Arizona, it's mandatory prison at five to 15. And his family had been there 
and they were decent people. And so I won the trial and it was my first jury trial and I got the conviction, but I had mixed feelings about the conviction because this kid was going to be, how old was he? He was in his twenties. I forget the exact. This wasn't your very first case, but it's one that sticks in your mind because it, it conflicted you. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Because as a prosecutor, you had a lot of prosecutors were all about the job coming down hard on criminals and then talking about this person's sentence and that person's sentence, almost like a badge of honor is, oh, I did a trial and then my, my guy got 62 years. I did a trial and my guy got 72 years. See, I'm better than you. And that's silly. And when I had the trial and the person got convicted and was going to prison, I felt bad about it. Did you expect to feel that way or was it a surprise? It was a surprise. I did not expect to. And then how did you handle to it? feel that way. How I handled it was, I think it gave me a good amount of empathy in not seeing the other side as not a real person. And a real person with real families who love them just as much as a victim's family loves, loves them. The interesting thing about you saying that is one of the things that I always prided myself in is having empathy for the offenders that I deal with because, and a lot of people can't do this, but they can't look at it from the offender's perspective. Like a lot of them, sometimes they're just sexually attracted to children. They don't know why, and they don't know how to handle it. So they do certain things. They get a hold of the material. And of course there's other people that are just purely evil. There's just pure evil out there. That's true. But a big majority of the cases that I assisted in prosecuting and interrogating you have to have a level of empathy for the people because when you show up in a search warrant, you're destroying a family. From my perspective, I always had trouble with that because I'm destroying a family. So to hear a prosecutor like you, even before you even came in contact with any of these types of crimes, you already had that empathetic piece. That really speaks a lot to the kind of person you are. I don't know about that, but that's how I, how I felt. I know about that. Thank you. It even started before that. When I was in college... One of my summer jobs I had was working for Nassau County, which is on Long Island. And we worked in the basement of a court in Hempstead. Our job was to interview people after they had been arrested, to ask them a list of financial questions to see if they qualified for a public defender, in essence. And during the summer, the county used us college kids. They didn't have translators number of people that were getting arrested only speak Spanish. I spoke Spanish, so I did that. And what I took from, away from that experience was that these were individuals who committed whatever crime. It could have been DUI to homicide, a wide range. I was one of the first people that they were having communication with after their arrest. What did I know? I was just some dumb college kid asking yeah. like, how much money they had and see if they qualified for a, an attorney. They had a bunch of questions for me. What was going to happen to me? What's going to happen next? They were grown men who were accused of a various range of crimes crying because they were scared. They were scared not because of necessarily what they did. They were scared because they of the unknown. They didn't understand the process. And no one in, within the system was giving them the respect, regardless of what they did, giving them the respect to say, okay, this is what's going to happen to you. This is what's happened this day. This is where you're going to go. This is how the criminal justice system will progress so they know what to expect. So th that left me thinking, well, do I want to be a public defender or do I want to be a, a prosecutor? Because what bothered me, putting aside what they did, they deserve to be treated with respect in terms of how our system works and be educated. They could have been evil incarnate but still understanding the process of what was going to happen one day to the next while they don't have their freedom, I think was not right. Did you think at the time that your, your position on that was the prevailing position amongst your peers or what are going to be your future peers through this whole process from that, when you're just a college kid interviewing people to now you're prosecuting cases and you come across this kid that got upset and made a bad decision in the blink of an eye. And in that whole time, you're feeling this empathy. Did you feel like that was the prevailing position or perspective? Out of, out of the summer in, interns, it was not the prevailing position because a lot of them just wanted to sit around all 
all day and play cards and do with stuff. And yeah, I was at a, to work. I took that with me when I became a prosecutor and tried to understand. Do you think having that position made you more, I would imagine, more moderate? I don't know if it made me more moderate or not. I really depended upon the case and the individual. But even if the individual did horrific things... They're still a human being. They're still a person. Yes. And they still deserve due process and to do the right thing. I I know we're, we're jumping ahead, but I had a case where we knew the guy created his own sexual exploitation video movie. We had it. It was recovered of a child, of a real person that he knew. We weren't sure of the identity of it, but was him in the video. What year was this, roughly? This would have been thinking it was 2001, 2002-ish. Gotcha, I'm gotcha. not going to give names because it's the detective that okay. messed up. But even though we had this video of him doing it, this horrific thing to a minor, the detective was not truthful. I'm not going to say lied, but I'll say it was not truthful or complete or open or honest in the search warrant affidavit. That was clear. So you excise the the parts that detective was not open and honest about. Right. And you include parts that he intentionally excluded. There's no way a judge would have signed the search warrant. So there would not have been probable cause. Is that along the lines of fruit of the poisonous tree? 100%. So therefore... They should not have got the search warrant. They should not have gotten to the home. They should have not got to the video. So I knew that. And as a prosecutor, some may say, well, ends justify the means, or not just as a prosecutor, but as a human being. The ends justify the means. This guy is exploiting a minor. He's having sexual intercourse with a minor. Tough luck on him. I have no sympathy for him. The ends justify the means. The problem is, our job is to do justice in a prosecutor and follow the law. So prosecutors have a higher standard of ethics than other attorneys, not to denigrate other attorneys. It's just the way it is. And there's a good reason for it yeah. because they have a lot of power. In that case, I had to drop the case and make the decision to dismiss the case because of the bad search warrant. That didn't make me popular with certain law enforcement. The, the detective wasn't happy about it but overall i have to say his leadership was and understood that what happened was wrong because at the end of the day whether you're law enforcement or a prosecutor to get into law and order the two separate people parts of it at the end of the day if they're going to do something and accomplish a goal such as hold someone accountable for what they did you want it to stick yeah even evil guy who did evil things still deserved to have his rights under our system of government applied. Because if we don't do that, then we really have fascism. How long did it take you to make that decision to drop the case? And how conflicted do you feel during that process? Issues, I believe, were brought to my attention by the defense attorney, and then I investigated. And after doing investigation and talking to people and listening to recordings, et cetera, then it was probably within a day after doing all that that I made that decision. Because it was a high profile case at the time, I had to get approval from the county attorney, the elected county attorney. And once I laid it out for him, it sucks, but it's the right thing to do. We have to do it. What do you think the offender, how do you think he responded when he found out it was being dropped? I'm sure he had a part. The problem with that is then the offender gets the message that They already have their own psychological issues to begin with that perhaps led them to commit the offense because sex offenders tend to be, I'm not sure what I would say the right term is, but they tend to believe that they are smarter than everyone above everyone and they're able to justify what they're doing in their minds for the most part. Some of them understand that what they're doing is wrong and they do it anyway, but a lot of them think they're better than everyone else. I had a couple people that I interviewed that were they clearly thought they were smarter than me. And you and I had a case together, Daniel Boone. You might remember that case back in 2001 where he was switching IP addresses. You had that perspective of seeing so many more cases on a broader scale. 
Correct, because I handled cases not just from your department, but also I handled what we refer to as hands-on cases, which I even, thinking about it now, don't like the breakdown between hands-on cases and sexual exploitation cases. In the Sex Crimes Bureau, we would refer to hands-on case, meaning that someone had hands on a child, so actually touched a child. And then we had the other cases, exploitation cases, where we said those are not hands-on cases. And classifying like that, I think, is wrong because then it, by calling something hands-on and something hands-off makes one worse than the other, and I think that's wrong. But handling a wide variety of cases, whether it was adult sexual assaults as well, we handled in sex crimes, to all sorts of different indecent exposures to child molestation, to, to sexual conduct with a minor, et cetera. I saw maybe a more wide range of offenders. So that led me to the conclusion and I've cross-examined a number of them. Their power of denial, I would say, is amazing. And I saw this too as a judge. I mean, I remember a particular case I handled as a judge where the guy is on video, right? It's him. The stuff is on his phone. We know who the kid was that wasn't involved because it was the child of a person he was dating. And he really wasn't interested in the person he was dating because he wasn't interested in adult women. And there's no way that he wasn't going to get convicted. But in talking to him and doing a settlement conference, and they agreed to waive the conflict to have me as the judge do the settlement conference, power of denial was strong. I think in these offenders, the power of denial is strong, perhaps because they think what they're doing is okay, or perhaps because if they admit it, then they're admitting to themselves something about themselves that they don't want to admit. I want to back up and talk about when you moved to sex crimes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So started in the trial group, we handle a wide variety of crimes. And then from there, you can apply to be in a specialty one of the specialty groups was the Sex Crimes Bureau, and I wanted to go there, so I applied there. What was your reason for wanting to go there? One of my motivations for joining the Sex Crimes Bureau had to do with some high school peers of mine that were involved in a high-profile case when they were members of the St. John's Lacrosse team where they were accused of sexually assaulting someone, and... What bothered me about it is that our high school principal went on the news and talked about how great these kids were and awesome students they were, et cetera, and they were not. They were not good students, and for the most part, they were not good people. They were bullies, they were jerks, and I knew about things they did in high school, but they were athletes, so people spoke up about them. Some pled guilty, some were acquitted, and I just thought that it was wrong and that in part motivated me to become a sex crimes prosecutor. So then I joined a sex crimes bureau that would have been in April-ish, I want to say, of, of 96. And there you handle everything that's a sex crime. And so I handled sexual assaults, child molest, even from even a decent exposure. Any early cases stick out, like your early sex crimes cases? One sad case is a case involving this kid his mother was, I believe, an exotic dancer and then meth addict. The dad was who knows who and who knows where. So the kid, therefore, is being raised by his grandparents. His grandmother worked. Grandfather was retired. And the kid was young and home alone with his grandfather. And his grandfather died in the kid's presence, and the kid actually called 911. How old when that happened? He Roughly? was probably in the, in the six to eight range in oh, that wow. range. It's terrible. And then as a result of that, the kid attempted suicide, and then the kid was in the hospital. And then one of the doctors said to the grandmother, he needs something positive in his life. Why don't you apply to the Valley Big Brother, Big Sister program to get him a big brother? Because he was basically with his grandfather, 24 seven yeah there's no dad the doctor said let's get him an influence so they applied for the valley big brother big system and they got unfortunately this guy who 
I wound up prosecuted. Oh, no. So that was sad because the kid's neglect background and trauma that he's been through is a reason why he wanted this, and then it turned out to, to do this. That was one of the sadder cases. Do you remember whatever became of that, of the prosecution or? Dupree went to prison. And in Arizona, we, one of the things I say when I teach a lot is, and I've been around pretty much the entire developed world, teaching people how to use software that, that do these types of investigations. And we have in the state of Arizona, not only in the country, we have the strictest sentencing guidelines, the strictest penalties for being in possession of sexual exploitation of a minor material or child sex abuse material than anywhere in the world. And even for assessed crimes in general. Yes. But the more controversial part of it is the sexual exploitation of a minor sentencing guidelines. That is correct. I worked for the National Center for Prosecution of Child Abuse, which is headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia. And what we did and what my focus was, was to travel around the country and train prosecutors and law enforcement officers in child sex crimes investigations and prosecutions. Specifically, I focused on sexual exploitation yeah. cases. So I got to, and also produced some guidelines as well as a lot of written material articles, et cetera. And what I got out of talking to people around the country and even around the world, because we had investigators come in from different parts of the world too, was how on one hand, lucky we are to be in Arizona because if you successfully investigate, apprehend, prosecute someone, you know that they're going to be out of society for a while. Whereas in other places, the sentencing laws were amorphous. In other words, it was a general range maybe, but not mandatory. And can you imagine going through all that investigation, doing a trial, even a sexual assault trial, convicting the person and then having no idea what the person would be sentenced to. Arizona moved to truth in sentencing to avoid that. I want to say 94, a lot of things changed. It was before I became a lawyer. And you can have a, a substantive debate concerning the sentencing laws in terms of is this a good range or is that a good range? I think, personally, having guidelines is a good thing because everyone's on notice. This is what it is if this crime is committed. So there's no secret to it. The other thing is you have consistency because if you have it be completely wide open, then you could have people being treated disparately even though they did essentially the same thing. Yeah. And I don't think that's fair to anybody. And not only are they amorphous outside of the state of Arizona, but not everywhere. Not everywhere. They also are so, they are lenient to an exponential degree from where they, in Arizona, one image, one visual depiction gets you 10 to 24 years, 17 being presumptive, 10 mitigating and 24 aggravating per visual depiction. Now there's, now no, you there, said- There's no place in, in, the, in, in the- And I verified that. There's no place- yeah, we're, we're rough on that. And again, you can have a good faith- debate and discussion as to whether or not that's proper or appropriate. But you're correct. In Arizona, the bottom line is that's a lot. Now, and then they have to run consecutive to each other, which is the thing as well. Imagine that. You go through the entire investigation, look at all the material, expose yourself to all that stuff, do all the work you can to go through it to find out that the offender received a sentence that is shorter than the amount of time it took you to investigate the case. I appreciate that sentiment, but I would challenge the logic and thinking with that sentiment. And the reason for that is because what justice is should be independent of the amount of work it took you to get there. The cost of labor shouldn't be factored into how our criminal justice system works. This isn't the construction problem. That's an interesting point of view. It's not about that. It's about being consistent within our system. Again, treating similarly situated people similarly. Yes. And following the law. And nowhere in our law should it be, it took this many hours to investigate this case. 
Therefore, we need to tack on some years to a person's sentence. That's not justice. That, I think, offends any notion of what our system should be about. Because it shouldn't be about, I put in all this effort. I'll give you an example. This is what really bothered me when I was prosecuting. What bothered me when I was a prosecutor is people would make plea offers. Prosecutors make plea offers to a defendant through their counsel, and they would say the deadline is X. The problem with plea offers and arbitrary deadlines is that while I understand it, because not every case can go to trial, so I understand that's why I have plea offers, and I understand deadlines because we can't let cases just sit around forever. And I understand deadlines because if the crime involves victim, the victim has a right to have their case ended in a timely manner. Sometimes that is through a plea agreement. But what I think prosecutors sometimes forget is that prosecutors who haven't ever had a client forget what it's like to work with a client. And there's a human being on the other side that has to make a decision about what, what they want to do. And it is an attorney that has to advise their client as to what they want to do. And if you give them some arbitrary deadline before discovery is completed, before maybe interviews are done, how can that lawyer properly advise their client of to what to do? In addition, with a lot of criminal defendants and offenders, there's also a psychology to it in terms of when they get to accepting the reality of their circumstances and their situation. Some people get to it at different times. So if they get to it a month after their indictment or if they get to it four months after their indictment, are they going to be punished for that? Or they have other circumstances in their life. I don't know. I'm a single parent. What am I going to do with my kids? Setting that up, et cetera. Maybe they need some time to do that. So I think setting just strict deadlines is bad. I also think setting deadlines, and I've, because I've heard prosecutors say this, which is, if you make me respond to this motion or if you make me do all these interviews and the plea offer goes away, that offended me when I was a prosecutor and I never did that. It offended me because in essence, what the prosecutor is telling the defense attorney is, if you make me do my job, I'm going to punish you. It's my job to do interviews. It's my job to respond to a motion. That's your job. So do your job saying that he needs to take this 10 year plea now, because if I have to work a few extra hours, then the plea's going away and he's going to get 20 years. So you're messing with someone's life over your effort and work laziness. I think it's just misunderstanding your role in the system. Oh, cause it's not about as a prosecutor and it's right. not about you right. as a prosecutor. It's not about how much effort you put in, just like it's not about how much effort you, the detective, put in. A, a DUI investigation with an accident, that takes a long time to investigate. Yeah. A long time to investigate. Uh, a typical, let's say, ag DUI person is going to get probation with four months in jail, whereas you can have a homicide investigation or a sexual assault investigation that takes less, and the person could be going away forever. So your time in doing the investigation should not impact the end result. Do the investigation the right way. I understand resources are not infinite, but, and as a prosecutor, work the case. Some cases will be easier than others in terms of effort, but that shouldn't dictate the outcome of the case. The, the law should dictate that. What occurred should dictate that how that person fits into the system in terms of compared to other similarly situated individuals should dictate that victim input should play a role in that. But how much I worked on this case? No. How much you worked on it, that will impact the cost of building on an extension to your house, but it's not going to impact or shouldn't impact justice. That's profound to me. Now, let me push back. It's absolutely logical what you say, and I agree with everything you say. I'm just saying from the perspective of the detective who is in the trenches that, has, that is beating themselves up, their personal life is in the toilet so that they can investigate these crimes and these offenders only to find out that they're not receiving what would seem to be 
adequate justice. Now you're bringing subjective feelings into it. Yes. And your subjective feelings should not impact the end, resu the end result. But I'm talking about the morale of the people that are doing these cases because we can't get to justice if the morale is at the point where nobody wants to do these cases because whether it's correct or not, they make that correlation. I busted my ass on this guy that's touching kids, that's doing this and that, and, and he got a slap on the wrist from the morale perspective over and over. Now, I will give you some anecdotal evidence of this. I used to teach part-time. I would go around the country and I would teach, I would teach the National Project VIC program to investigators. And we taught the Maryland ICAC unit. We taught them, I was there four times, four different times over the span of five years. We would go around the room. Every time I would teach, I would ask, how long have you been doing this? How long have you been, how long have you been investigating crimes against children? How long have you been a, an investigator, computer forensic examiner? And in, I remember one time I went around the room and there was one person that had more than a year on. And I happened to notice that the turnover was extreme in Maryland compared to the other task forces that I went to. Part of the Project Vic National System was how to teach investigators to identify what is an exploitive image, what is an, an abusive image, what's illegal and what's not illegal, so we can classify, categorize those images. Unfortunately, part of the training is we would show child exploitation to the investigators in the class and the, to the students. We would show them child exploitation and we would have them categorize it. Is it illegal? Is it not illegal? Federally. And in the state of Maryland, I will never forget this. I pointed to one of the images that we've used, we had used in trainings across the country. And I pointed to an image and it is an image of a toddler, prepubescent female. It is zoomed to about her nipples down to her knees. Her legs are spread completely open and there is a cherry sitting on her belly button. What would you categorize that? And one of the students looked up and said, that image is not illegal in the state of Maryland. I was floored. I'm not sure that person is right. Number one, it could be a person was just jaded by a, a bad experience or that person's uneducated. Would you say that there's no correlation between the sentencing outcomes and their longevity in that position? I didn't say that there's no correlation. Do you believe there is some type of correlation? I think there likely is and there, or, and there could be. But objectively, you can't do that. The question shouldn't be, therefore, or the answer shouldn't be, therefore, because there is this connection, we need to get as much time as possible, so therefore we increase longevity. That is ignoring the fact of, let's start at the beginning. Why is it that expectation? Why is there that correlation? And maybe we're not doing things up front in the process in terms of educating and handling and treating our law enforcement officers in the right way where that makes a difference. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If we educated them better, I'm not, and again, I'm not insulting law, law, or law enforcement at all. What I'm saying is if we educated them better up front in terms of the realities and expectations and what their role is, sometimes as a prosecutor, your best decision and your best result is not charging a case. You get a submittal from law enforcement. Law enforcement investigates, they may arrest or not, and then they submit their police reports to a prosecutor that makes a decision as to whether or not a complaint's gonna be filed, and then after that, you get a probable cause and determination that can lead to an information or an indictment, and then the criminal justice system starts. Have when you get that police report on your desk, and then you have, you're reviewing it and all the other related materials to make a decision as to whether or not to charge someone with a crime. And think about it. Charging someone with a sex crime is a big deal, right? Because if there's no evidence and or you get it wrong, okay, the case goes away eventually. But that person was still charged with a sex crime. Which, as we know, in the court of public opinion. Right. That's a big deal because yes. you make that decision. Maybe it's in the media. Maybe it's not. But that person's family may know, that person's employer may know, and they could lose family, job, 
income, et cetera, even if they didn't do it and or even if there's insufficient evidence to obtain a conviction. So making the decision to not charge someone sometimes should be celebrated versus charging someone and getting a million years sentence. As a prosecutor, your job is to do justice. So I think some of the best decisions prosecutors make sometimes are not charging someone versus charging someone. I'll give you an example. It doesn't mean that the person is a good person, doesn't mean the person is an outstanding person. But I had a case, this was a child physical abuse case, not sexual exploitation, but I think it illustrates the point. I had a physical abuse case. And before the police report got to my desk, it had already been Lee's story on the TV news, front page of the paper about this horrific physical abuse situation. And I get the police report and I'm reading it and it's about some fractures. And the police detective's theory was the boyfriend of the mom had access to the kid on this particular day and this is when the fracture occurred. But then I read the medical records and it discussed how there was calcification and it was, there was, the injury was not acute, meaning that it didn't happen then. So the fracture happened before that day. So therefore the detective's theory that this incident on this day is when the boyfriend created the injury was wrong. The medical evidence didn't support it. Did the detective know that? The detective saw the records, but I'm not sure the detective understood the difference between acute and subacute or understood what calcification means. This isn't an insult to, to the detective. The detective didn't know. The problem is that as a prosecutor, you can have all this pressure on you because you have the public pressure that this is top story of the news. This is front page of the Arizona Republic. And this is a child who injured. Do the right thing, charge the person, worry about it later. That's not the role of a prosecutor. So I didn't charge that person. The detective had arrested that person. I did what's called a further, which means I didn't say, no, there will never be charges. But I said, hey, this injury did not occur on that day. I'm not saying your suspect didn't do it. We just have no information at this time that he did it. Maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't. We need to investigate more because the injury didn't happen on that day. And the investigation only focused on that day. We need to do more. That means that the person gets released because you don't file charges. Right. You don't file charges in 48 hours, the person's going to be. Or if you don't get a probable cause finding and the person's in custody within 10 days, the person will be released. And so that's what happened. And by, and I'm not just saying this because I made the decision because there are others that agreed with the decision. And in making that decision, the detective went ballistic. Ballistic. Went off. You know. Na nasty emails. Emails to my boss. Emails to the county attorney. That included the assistant chief of police in that department and how horrible I was. And I guess I'm the only one that cares about children. And I'm the only one that cares about this injured child because that detective in that incident probably didn't get any sleep, put a lot of effort and work into it, interviewed a bunch of people, spent a lot of time at the hospital, dealt with the poor injured kid who I'm sure is in a lot of pain, dealt with that kid's mother, talked to the doctor. A lot of work yeah. went into that. So based upon what you had said to me before, I should have said as the prosecutor, since you put a lot of work into it, evidence be damned, let's prosecute this person. And let's go through a years long prosecution where we go to trial and the jury says not guilty because the evidence says subacute and evidence of calcification, meaning healing fracture. So obviously it couldn't occur that day. And meanwhile, that person was sitting in, in jail the whole time. And then a the person turns around and sues. This is profound. This, this is profound. This, it's, I've never even looked at it. I never looked at that from that perspective ever. 
and it makes sense. I've only looked at it from the emotional side. Exactly. So a lot of times you have the butting of heads between the prosecutor and the law enforcement. I'm not saying one's better than the other. It's just where you sit in the system and where your head is at. My head, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm perfect, but a prosecutor's head should be at, is there a reasonable likelihood of conviction? Do we have all the evidence? The detective is gathering and giving. Right. And everyone in that process needs to be objective. In that particular case, you had perhaps a training failure of that detective because maybe he or she didn't understand medical records and didn't understand terms. And if you're investigating certain cases, you should probably understand a term. Just like if you're doing sexual exploitation of a minor cases, that's computer assisted. You should probably understand computer terms and you yes. understand what unallocated space is and you should understand things of that nature. And, yes. and that person didn't and didn't understand why that person was wrong and then was emotional about it. Now, I can't tell you how long this person had been on the job or how long this person investigated these cases or whatever the case may be or what trauma that person had been through. And seeing a child with a broken arm is a triggering event for that particular detective and bringing up trauma. What it does for that detective is then it throws away all logic, common sense, and reason. Now, is that detective doing a good job? Again, not blaming that detective. Right. Because we up front didn't handle that detective. Getting back to that. So what is the training that, that you... There's ideal and then there's real, right? So in reality, what you do is, as in every department is different, but typically you test and apply to go from wherever you are into that, to be a detective in that department. And then it's really, are you qualified? Are you a good detective? Are you going to be a good fit? Do you have enough experience? Yes. Boom. Here you go. Here's your case. There's nothing that is done up front that I'm aware of. And maybe somewhere it's done this way. And I've been a judge now for about 12 years. So I've been out of yeah. the game for a while. But where that says, okay, we're going to accept you tentatively. But before we give you a caseload, we're going to put you through some stuff. Not a gauntlet, but a stuff of training. We're going to prepare you emotionally and mentally for these cases. We're going to give you upfront tools so that hopefully you can recognize in yourself when you're having a trauma response so you can use the tools that we help you. And because all your colleagues have had this training as well, your colleagues, your peers are going to recognize this in others who may not be recognized themselves and, and intervene. And I have a process for it that isn't about punishment. It's about support would this training teach if a detective recognizes that they're get, they're having a trauma response that they would then recuse themselves from that investigation and have someone else take over it, it depends maybe it's a timeout in terms of i need to do whatever i do and then take a break so how do you ground yourself how does brad ostrowski ground himself honestly let me know and then I'll do it because it's difficult. Yes. And there's mindfulness. I've been through a weeks long mindfulness course that helps you, teaches you stay in the moment and be in the moment and feel emotions and understand your emotions without judgment. Meaning, why am I feeling this way? Why am I reacting this way? Okay, I'm doing it. It's neither good nor bad. It is. And then you ground yourself in the moment and it brings you back into the moment and, and focuses you. So I think mindfulness education and training would be important. I think telling, uh, you know, let's, let's say sexual exploitation of a, of a minor, of a minor state. Right. Right. All right. Great. Eric, congratulations. We're going to bring you in to be this detective to handle computer-assisted sexual exploitation of minor cases. Here's your caseload. Let's say doing forensics. Here's a hard drive. Go look. And, hey, I went to my IASIS training. And I did this other forensic training. And I know about computers. I'm going to do it. And you're so excited because you're doing your investigation and you know 
how to properly do it and you understand how to look in the computer and look for the information and you get the data. And now the dude has like 10,000 images. And now it's your first case. And now you've been exposed to 10,000 images. That is exactly what happened to right. me. That is exactly what happened back then. There was no talk at all. Arizona got its internet crimes grant in 2001 when I started. Shift started in 2007. They were funded in 2007. That pro that's when that program began. There was no training about anything. And that is exactly what happened to me. My first case was involving an online site called Photo Bucket. And the guy, the and the offender had uploaded thousands of pictures and videos to Photo Bucket, and it slapped me in the face exactly like you said. The same thing happened to me. So I know we're going to get there, but here I am, a sex crimes prosecutor, and I am 26 years old, so very young in my career, stupid, yeah, naive. Think I'm a lot smarter and better than I am. We all did. I'm, I am not as smart or as good today as I thought I was back then. <laughs> yeah. But there was always a person designated to handle sexual exploitation of a minor cases within the Sex Crimes Bureau. And there was one person, and it wasn't a full-time gig because there wasn't a lot of cases. Right. Because at that time, the only cases were, in essence, yeah. and there's exceptions, obviously, but in essence, there was stings done by the United States Postal Inspector with the help of the FBI. So physical. Physical, because the way people obtained their sexual exploitive images of minors back then was through mail order. They'd buy things, they'd meet people, and then the postal inspector would meet up and do a sting and right. et cetera. Or sometimes it wasn't a sting, sometimes they caught in the mail, whatever. But essentially it was printed material. Right. Whether it was printed images, whether it was a magazine, books, what have you. And those were few and far between, right? What year is this? 98-ish. Okay. And that person who handled that case, who was a mentor of mine, his name was Joe Heilman, recently passed away, and he actually eventually became a judge too. Sorry to hear that. Best human beings I've ever, ever met. He was prosecuting those cases. Then, a detective, then detectives came in one day and presented him with a computer-related case. And they went to him because... He was doing it. and he didn't even want a computer in his office yeah. and no offense to him. It's just, that was the time that, that was the time. I remember judges around that time didn't all have computers in their office. I remember when they were going to put computers in judges offices at the time. And there were judges who said, no way. Why do I need one of these Yeah. in my office? Can you imagine not using any form of technology at all period to do your, we had a meeting in the Sex Crimes Bureau, uh, Every week we would have a staffing where we'd all get together and talk about our cases and collectively determine charging decisions and collectively determine plea offers and things of that nature so that we, again, had some type of consistency in terms of how people were treated. Yeah. And he came in and talked about this case He's, and he said, I don't know anything about anything. And I s had some computer background and experience. I said, I'll do it. And I volunteered because I said, oh, cool, computer stuff and technology. I love science. I love computer technology. That would be cool. I didn't know anything about sexual exploitation of a minor because I hadn't handled a case to date. I hadn't seen it to date. I handled countless child molest cases and countless cases where children were sexually abused. I had kids on the witness stand talking about it. I met with victims countless times and talked to them about it. That does not prepare you to handle sexual exploitation of a minor because it's one thing to read about it, to talk about it, to ask questions about it, to argue about it, and then see it. Completely different because while there are some cases I have where the kids' descriptions of what happened, like there were these popping in my mind right now, these twin girls who were molested. And like right now I'm in the courtroom and I see them on the stand and I hear them talk, right? Wow. That memory is there. But I've done more 
of those cases that I've forgotten about. However, images of child sexual exploitation, I remember each one. Yeah. That it's, is, it's different. It is. Right? Wow. And when I'm volunteering because I'm 20, 27, young gunner of a prosecutor that I was wanting to yep. build my career and, and move up the ladder of success, et cetera, et cetera. I thought this would be a good opportunity to do it. Plus it was something cool that I was interested in. Yeah. And so he, you know, Joe Hyman was happy to give me the case. And that's where I met John Stevens and Tommy Kalesa, who were leaders, not only in, and I give them a lot of kudos, leaders, not only in Arizona, but in the country in terms of handling these cases, because I learned after traveling around the country, teaching the country that Phoenix police in particular and Maricopa County in general, probably were years advanced and ahead of the rest of the country when it, most of the, when it came to prosecuting him, these cases, computer assisted sexual exploitation of a minor, because not only were they handling image cases, they're also handling sting cases using AOL. America so, online. To, exactly. Because you have to explain what that is now. And they used AIM. They chatted over AIM. Exactly. AOL Instant Messenger. So that's how I got involved in it. And then it was great. Boom. Go and run with it. And I did. So I handled these cases. I tried the first computer-assisted sexual exploitation of a minor case in the state of Arizona. And there were a lot of challenges with that. The challenges were this is no one had ever tried a case like that before. I, I remember doing an evidentiary hearing when the de defense attorney is trying to preclude evidence, claiming that the forensics did not meet the standard under Rule 702 of the Arizona Rules of evidence to be able to be presented. It was silly, but in that defense attorney's defense, it's not like it had been done before in Arizona. And I remember. You know, laughing inside when the defense attorney is asking questions of the forensic examiner, what's a cookie? It, it wasn't really an evidentiary hearing as much as it was educational. Uh, yeah. The defense attorney was getting a free class on computer technology from the detective who it was either Jim Mills from Mesa Police Department, who's probably in his day the best computer forensic examiner in the country. I could not agree more. He was my IASIS CFCE coach. I absolutely had nothing but respect. I love Jim. He's a great guy. So is that Jim Mills or who was, I would say, grandfather of computer forensics in the Phoenix Police Department? Bob Rodelli. It was one of those two guys. The whole, whole case was challenging for a number of reasons. Because you had a lot of us flying blind because we'd never done this before. And... and the defense attorney, too. It's not like the defense attorney had a lot of people to talk to as well as how do we defend against? How do I ask yeah. questions? Did the police do the, the right job? I don't know. And then you have a judge who hasn't handled this before. I'll give you an example of what the judge did, which in retrospect, you may laugh. At the time, I disagreed with what the judge was doing. At the time, I tried to convince the judge that what she was doing was wrong. And... There's no way it would happen now, but it was just an old school mentality. So these images that we had were obviously digital. So the evidence was digital. They were presented on a digital medium and they were admitted into evidence as a digital medium. And then the jury, I propose, would be given a clean laptop for them to view the images during their deliberations if they so chose because you have to give the jury a means to examine and look at the evidence. And the defense attorney objected to that. He said, it'll be a clean laptop. You could play with it all you want. Look at it. There's nothing on it. Yeah. It's just a way for them to put in the floppy disk drive. It only contained the charged images and maybe some other things in any event. And that wasn't good enough for the judge. The judge said, no, you need to print out the images and we'll admit those. And I said, 
Jed, that's a bad idea. Let me explain. Well, I had it went over the reasons. First of all, is that I'm l limited by the quality of the printer I have. So what I print may not be what the image looks like. So it's going to degrade the quality. And, and it, again, this is 1998. 1998 printers. This isn't today with laser jets and all that stuff. Not only this 1998 printers, this is 1998 printers that the county had. So it was 1991 printers. Brand new off the shelf. Exactly. So I said, that's going to be an issue. You're asking me to provide the jury with something that is not the evidence. They're going to see something that is different from the quality of the evidence. Number one. Number two, that's not how the defendant looked at that. Right. That's wrong. Number three, you're asking me to create more child sexploitation images. This is contraband. So you wouldn't tell me, prosecutor, in a possession of cocaine case. I know this is the cocaine that the defendant had on his possession, for jury purposes, can you create some more cocaine and give us some different cocaine to give to the jury? Not the same cocaine, but different cocaine. Let's make more drugs. You wouldn't do that because no. that would be just silly and ridiculous. And so I use that example because sexual exploitation images are contraband. Right. They're illegal to possess. So you have to treat them that way, which brought on a whole host of issues when you talk about the discovery of these and how you let the defense attorney see them, et cetera, which we didn't talk about. But eventually the judge was like, I'm dismissing your case unless you print. We're in the middle of trial. So do I take what's called a special action and take a time out in the trial and the jury sitting there it's for the court of appeals to maybe or maybe not take up the issue. Plus it's, brand new issue. So what are the odds of them dealing with it? Yeah. And we had a print and the guy got convicted. Those are the issues you had to deal with back in the day as the kids liked it. Did, did the judge review the images in, in, in the cases you remember more times or well, not before, right? But obviously they're presented in front of the jury. And in fact, I got, dressed down by a judge who called me into his office and yelled at me ex parte, meaning it was just me. The defense attorney wasn't there, which was, by the way, unethical to do. Right. But the judge brought me in because he was so offended by what I did. And what I did is I put the image name as the defendant possessed it in the indictment because you charge multiple images to avoid a duplicitous indictment. In other words, having multiple charges for the same image, you have to identify each indiv individual image individually. Uniquely, yeah. Uniquely, right. So how do you do that? By its file name. Yep. And some of these file names, I didn't make them up. You didn't make it up, but they're going to be obscene. Yep. They're going to say 10-year-old, blah, blah, blah. You know, they're, they're named and they could be gross and offensive. Yes. You say, count one. On such such day, the defendant within Maricopa County committed the crime of sexual exploitation of minor by knowingly possessing an image depicting a child in a sexually exploitative pose and or a sexual act to wit file 123.jpg. You give the name. And so the names were specific. And again, it's the purpose of it isn't to be gross. The purpose isn't to prejudice and purpose isn't to do anything other than make sure that your conviction sticks because you're giving the person notice as to what count one refers to this particular image. And so the judge brought me into his office and yelled at me, how dare you put this language in the indictment? I can't have my clerk read the indictment to the jury because they do that in a criminal trial. Say those words. How dare you? You need to fix this. I said, Judge, number one, I'm not sure we should be having this decision because this is an ex parte communication. Number two, I didn't make this up. That's the evidence. Yeah. The jury's going to hear it. You need to change it. You need to fix it. So that judge later, I would have a problem with because he did not like the sentencing 
scheme in the state of Arizona, which again is flat time, 10 to 24 years, mandatory consecutive per per image. So if you charge someone with 10 counts, which is 10 images, and they get convicted, the mandatory minimum sentence is 10 times 10, which is 100 years. He didn't like that. So he would throw out some cases because he didn't like the sentencing scheme. He was reversed very quickly by the Arizona Court of Appeals. But that's uh, because he couldn't understand the big deal. This is just images. It's just possession. Who cares? It's harmless. It's harmless. Isn't it better for him to do that in his home, looking at him and doing whatever he is? Than going hands-on? Going hands-on. So that's what the mentality that uh, a number of people have that you have to over, overcome. People didn't like these cases. So they started bringing me cases and that's how I got involved. And then it became so, the case law became so significant that it almost exclusively became what I did. And then other departments started doing it as well. And not only that, but because we were on the, the beginning in other words, because of the great work they did, they handed me the cases and they, Tommy Kless is one of the best detectives that you'll come across. He is, in my mind, the best detective that I have ever known in my life and it probably has ever existed. I have so much respect for that man. I even interviewed him before I tested to be on the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. He is amazing. Anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off, sorry. No, that's, that's okay. You're right. I was the first prosecutor to handle these and I deal with a lot of legal hurdles and handle things that hadn't been done before but I wouldn't have done that if but for the great cases and great investigations that were provided to me by Tom Kalesa under the leadership of Jim and Stevens. Let's go back to the impact when preparing people. How else can we prepare them? Because that is just profound that we slap you in the face with it. No one ever tells you when, you're, when we signed up for this, no one ever told us, this is going to shock your conscience. I remember the very first image. I can see it in front of me like it's on a screen. Uh, the very first image that I saw, I wasn't prepared. It was all technology. And to this day, someone can give you a few prompts of an image and you can pull it up in your mind. Yep, absolutely. Same with me. It is weird. But there's a ton of cases that I did in my career, a ton of cases you did in your career that you totally forgot about. Yes. And even if someone prompted you, you would have forgotten about. Yes. And that's not how sexual exploitation of a minor cases work. You remember every image. Thank you for listening to Justice Under Question with the Honorable Brad Ostrowski, part one. In part two, Brad and I dig down a little deeper into the mental health ramifications on those prosecuting these crimes, those adjudicating these crimes, as well as everybody else involved in that legal system. As always, if you know someone that needs to hear this podcast, please do not hesitate to send it to them. If they need to hear it anonymously, send me an email to harmlessthepodcast at gmail.com, and I will make sure they listen to it. Your action just may save someone's life. Thank you. Coming up on Justice Under Question, Part 2. What happens when there's a part of you that you can't share? Let's say you find yourself with an attraction to underage children, prepubescent children. You find yourself being attracted to time. Now, you can't go to your buddy at work at the water cooler and say, Hey, did you see that four-year-old? over there wasn't she attractive no one thinks about the jurors that we expose to this stuff we are effing up these regular innocent people who have nothing to do with this world and have never had anything to do with this world and we're forcing them compelling them to participate in and be exposed to it i think a person can go through a homicide and then go live their life trauma free after that. I'm not sure a person can go through a sexual exploitation minor trial and live their life the same way after that.